Uh, welcome everybody to uh, our AICGS webinar series uh, devoted to the 30th anniversary of German reunification. Uh, today is our third in the series. We've already done some sessions on the evolution of LGBTQ rights in Germany since 1990, as well as Germany's colonial pasts um, and how they have affected discourses over the last 30 years. We have an upcoming webinar, uh, likely on October 13th, which will be on German climate policy. But today, we're gonna talk about Germany's party system and how it has evolved over the last 30 years. And I'm very happy to briefly introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Frank Decker, who is a professor in comparative government and politics at the Institute for Political Science and Sociology at the University of Bonn, uh, where he has been teaching and researching since 2001. Uh, he studied political science, economics, journalism, and public law. Gee, that's almost um, Faustian. Um, at the universities of Mainz and Hamburg uh, back in the 1980s. And after he gained his doctorate in 1993 on the failure of government and environmental protection, uh, he completed his habilitation in 1999 um, and then published a monograph on right-wing populism in Western democracies. Uh, before he came to Bonn, he was at Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg, where he was a re research assistant at the Institute for Political Science. Um, his main research interests focus on uh, issues like institutional reforms in Western democracies, federalism, party systems, right-wing populism, uh, the EU polity, and German politics. Uh, he is very well published, and um, we're very um, happy to have him with us today. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Decker. Thank you very much, Eric, for your nice uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, uh, to join you and uh, I'm thankful that you give me uh, the opportunity uh, to talk about the and discuss with you about uh, the German uh, party system. Uh, I will talk, if it's okay, I will talk 25 minutes uh, about uh, the general development of the German party system before and after reunification, uh, the belated arrival of right wing populism in the Federal Republic the rise of the Greens and the effects of the Corona crisis and the probable and less probable coalitions after the next federal elections. So let's get started. Over the 30 years since German reunification, the country's party system has undergone a dramatic transformation. Gone are the days of the bipolar system with two parties representing the so-called bourgeois or middle-class camp, the Christian and free Democrats, and two parties in the leftist camp on the other side, the social Democrats and Greens. In its place, a complex six-party system has emerged. On the one hand, this complexity stems from the fact that the two newcomers, the left party and the right-wing populist alternative for Germany, are located at the ideological fringes. Other parties therefore hesitate to consider them as coalition partners or rule out any sort of cooperation. The former applies to the left party, while the AFD is widely seen as beyond the pale. In this sense, there no longer is a common left or right cap. The other reason can be found in the altered coalition dynamics at the political center, made up of the Christian and Social Democrats, along with the Greens and Free Democrats. Both the Greens' association with the SPD, as well as that of the Free Democrats with the CDU-CSU, are a thing of the past. Coalition politics and strategies are therefore a key factor in the formation of any government. Up until the end of the 1970s, the Federal Republic was home to a highly concentrated two and a half party system made up of two larger parties, the Christian and Social Democrats, who were therefore disc 
described as catch-all parties or Volksparteien, and the significantly smaller Free Democrats. During the heyday, both larger parties were able to obtain a combined 90% of the vote. Due to the higher turnout of the era, this represented around 80% of all eligible voters. In 2017, their common share was less than half of that. Until the emergence of the Greens as a fourth party in the 1980s, the Free Democrats served as a hinge within the party system. They could act as kingmakers by either forming a coalition with the Christian or Social Democrats. Throughout the history of the Federal Republic, there has never been a one-party government. So I will show you uh, two charts. The first chart shows the fragmentation of uh, the party system. Uh, it's uh, based on the index of uh, uh, effective parties. This looks a little like a bath tube. Uh, fragmentation is high at the beginning of the Federal Republic in the late 40s and early 50s. And then the party system got highly concentrated for more than two decades before fragmentation started again, slowly in the 80s, and then more rapidly uh, in the 90s and uh, after 2000. And uh, the next chart shows that this is uh, reflected in the combined votes and share of the seats of the uh, two larger parties, the Christian and Social uh, Democrats. Uh, 2013 is a little uh, exception because two of the smaller uh, parties, the AFD and the FDP, uh, failed uh, to surpass the threshold of uh, 5% that is necessary to enter uh, parliament. The bipolar system of the 1980s with its two clearly defined camps was shaken by the entry of the post-communist party of democratic socialism after German reunification. The PDS represented the sole successful remnant of the collapsed GDR. All other parties that had emerged during the period of East Germany's political transformation were quickly absorbed by West Germany's established parties. The path of social democratization that was pursued by other communist parties in, of Central and Eastern Europe was closed off for the PDS, as Germany already had a social democratic actor in the SPD. The PDS therefore maintained many of its orthodox positions and remained a quasi-communist party. As a re regionalist party in the east of the country, the PDS was nonetheless able to survive in the reunified nation by lending a voice to East Germans that had been left dissatisfied and disillusioned by the economic consequences of the country's reunification in the 1990s. This meant that in Eastern Germany, the party continued to receive sufficient support to be included in some regional governments relatively quickly. Remaining largely an East German phenomenon, the PDS did not initially call the fundamental principles of coalition formation into question. This would not happen until the emergence of a nationwide left party, today known simply as the left. A unified far-left party arrived by way of a merger between the PDS and the splinter movement of former SPD members that had left the party in 2005 to protest Chancellor Schröder's welfare and labor market reforms. Former SPD leader Oskar Lafontaine would head the new party. In its first national election in 2005, the left party's electoral success already acted as a roadblock to the formation of any conventional coalition. 
the red-green alliance on the left or the black-yellow coalition between the Christian and Free Democrats. This left no option but to form the first grand coalition since 1966 under the leadership of Angela Merkel, who has been in office ever since. After 2005, Germany was therefore home to a five-party system. Notable compared to the development of party systems in both other European countries, as well as the United States, was the absence of a relevant far-right party. Why did Germany continue to remain a blank spot on the map of right-wing populism up until the AFD's formation in 2013, when its neighbors had seen the rise of similar parties since the 1980s? In 2012, an article, in an article published, uh, I cited three reasons behind the lack of success. First of all, the twin issues of immigration and integration were not discussed in a contentious manner in Germany, both within society and among parties. It was deemed to be best addressed behind the scenes. Secondly, as the leader of the right of center camp, the Christian Democratic sister parties had historically been able to retain voters at the far right fringe through their defense of conservative positions. And third of all, right wing populist parties and their ability to organize a potent political force had always been hampered by the stigmatization of right wing extremism, the proverbial shadow of Hitler. Two of these three reasons have been gradually eliminated since the mid-2000s. The Sarrazin debate of 2010 surrounding the allegedly failed integration of Turkish migrants and, the, and their descendants illustrated that the topic of immigration could no longer be ignored by the established political parties. At the same time, the increasing liberalization of the Christian Democratic parties in social cultural questions produced a niche within the party system that the AFD was able to occupy in later years. The same applied to the issue of Europe, which served as the immediate catalyst behind the AFD's formation. The party explicitly rejected the Eurozone rescue policies that had received the, uh, the support of all other parties. For the AFD's voters, the issue of migration had already been more important in 2013, however, when the party narrowly failed to cross the 5% threshold to enter the Bundestag. The refugee crisis of 2015 allowed the party to wholly embrace its unequivocal opposition on the topic as the AFD went from electoral success to electoral success. Its level of support is about twice as high in the East as it is in the West. In the former GDR, the AFD nowadays fulfills the role of a protest party that had previously been exercised by the left parties. Now this chart show you the electoral uh, results of the party since uh, its emergence in 2013. Um, the bold letters are the results for the East German uh, states. And you see they are about as twice as high as those uh, in the West. And uh, if we have a look at uh, the next chart, uh, you, you will see that the rise of the party in 2015 was uh, connected with the refugee uh, crisis. And uh, um, the approval rates uh, rose again uh, after the election when um, the ne ne negotiations of the 
Jamaica coalition failed. And of course, it is uh, attributed to the miserable uh, performance of the Grand Coalition. The AfD's establishment has shifted the balance of power within Germany's party system to the right. In 1998, 2002 and 2005, the three left of center parties continued to hold a clear combined lead over the CDU, CSU and FDP before the center right camp managed to surpass their opponents once again in 2009. By 2013, the three right-of-center parties, now including the AFD, had amassed a lead of eight points before widening this gap to 18 points in 2017. This can be partially explained by the AFD's inroads in two particular segments of the electorate. As is the case in other countries, the AFD managed to not just win over voters, that had previously abstained from going to the polls, it also acquired a substantial number of former supporters from the SPD and left party. Now, since 2017, uh, the gap has closed a little bit due to the rise of the Greens. So let me now address some of the most recent developments. The AFD's crisis, the rise of the Greens, the effects of the pandemic and the weakness of both the Christian and Social Democrats. The AFD's internal power struggle between the more moderate and radical wings has escalated so, to such an extent that another split no longer seems impossible. The just mentioned third explanatory factor concerning the historic weakness of right-wing populism in Germany therefore still applies. The interesting thing about the 1990s, the first post-reunification decade, was that while no right-wing party could establish itself on the wider political stage, right-wing extremism in its various guises not only remained a constant presence, but actually grew substantially, even culminating in terrorist acts. Wherever and whenever right-wing conservative or populist parties emerged, for example, the Republicans in the early 1980s, right-wing extremists sought to use every opportunity to attach themselves to these new parties. In doing so, they hoped to overcome the stigmatization that has plagued extreme right movements. The challenge of far-right infiltration is notorious and has accompanied the AFD from its very beginning. Germany's domestic intelligence service and scholars have, that have studied the parties believe that around a third of its officials and delegates hold right-wing extremist positions. The AFD's polling slump can also be explained by a change in the political agenda. Neither climate change nor the COVID-19 pandemic are adequately addressed by the party. While the response to the coronavirus has lifted the approval ratings of the governing parties, the Greens have benefited from the increasing significance of climate change in the wake of Fridays for Future protests. Having come in last among the parties represented in the Bundestag in the most recent federal election, the Greens have since firmly established themselves as the second political force in the country with a steady 20% in national polls over the past two years. In the process, they have replaced the SPD as the strongest party of the left of center camp. The successful reorganization of the party leadership with Robert Habeck and Annalena Baerbock and the miserable performance of both governing parties up until the pandemic have also contributed to the Greens' success. As a result of the Green surge, the political balance of power has once again slightly shifted back to the left. Yet the parties of the left of Center camp are still short of a majority of their own. 
A look at the composition of the electorate helps explain why. Just as the AFD is winning over working class voters, the Greens have been able to make inroads into the affluent electorate of the center-right parties. Even as their political programs continue to promote more left-leaning policy solutions, this has made it easier for the Greens to enter alliances with the Christian and Free Democrats. In today's party system, they therefore fulfill the role of a political hinge not dissimilar to the FDP of the 1960s and 70s. The pandemic has once again significantly transformed the balance of power in the party system. The parties in government benefited from a crisis management that was widely seen as one of the more competent international examples, while the opposition parties saw their polling numbers decline. The AFD and FDP, also plagued by infighting, suffered larger losses than the Greens and left party. Within the Grand Coalition, the Christian Democrats proved to be the main beneficiary in no small part added by the continued popularity of Angela Merkel. Now you can see uh, the chart. You see that the pandemic is a real game changer now in party uh, competition with all parties stagnating or losing and uh, the Christian uh, Democrats skyrocketing, uh, skyrocketing and um, um, approaching 40% uh, now uh, in the polls. Whether the Christian Democrats will be able to maintain these good polling numbers in the election year of 2021 and thereby defend its position as the undisputed strongest actor in German politics, a position it has held since 2009, remains doubtful, however. On the one hand, as the crisis continues, the political agenda could shift towards questions of economic redistribution, and this would presumably benefit the parties of the left and potentially the AFD as well. At the same time, we still have no answer as to who will succeed Merkel as a party's leading candidate in 2021. The only thing that appears certain is that it will not be another woman. None of the three current candidates for the CDU's leadership post are cited by the wider public as the best option for the chancellery. Instead, Bavaria's state premier and leader of the CSU, Markus Söder, is seen as the most capable successor to Angela Merkel. It seems rather difficult to imagine, however, that any of the candidates will be able to command the kind of support elicited by Merkel. The Social Democrats have already agreed on a chancellor candidate and selected Finance Minister Olaf Scholz. This is not without a certain sense of irony, as Scholz suffered a stinging defeat in the SPD's 2019 leadership contest, contest which subsequently raised questions about a possible departure from Merkel's cabinet. Considering his recent past, it seems hard to imagine a Scholz candidacy gaining significant traction during the campaign. Scholz is furthermore beset by two financial scandals whose resolution could extend into the election year. While the SPD has proven incapable of breaking out of its long-term polling slump, the Greens are in no hurry to answer the question as to who will be the party's face for the campaign. Its co-leaders Habeck and Baerbock will resolve the issue among each other. Habeck's higher levels of popularity among the general electorate might just be the decisive factor. In light of the fact that the Greens' core competency of climate protection is set to play a dominant role in next year's campaign, 
the party enjoys the best starting position of any political actor heading into 2021. This is true, not least in terms of potential coalition. If today's grand coalition, which is the third within a period in six of 16 years, were to come to an end, the Greens are part of all alliances that are both mathematically and politically possible. As a presumed junior partner to the CDU-CSU, as part of a Jamaica coalition with the Christian and Free Democrats, within a red-red-green coalition of the left, or a so-called traffic lights coalition between the SPD, FDP, and the Greens. Which coalition, given the choice, would the Greens prefer? The party leadership is said to have sympathies for a coalition with the Christian Democrats. That is understandable in the sense of this coalition representing one of the less risky options. In an alliance with the SPD and the left or the SPD and the FDP, they might, however, be able to appoint the chancellor. Forgoing this opportunity in favor of being the junior coalition partner alongside the Christian Democrats appears doubtful. Looking at the three factors that determine the outcome of the election, of any election, candidates, issues, and coalition dynamics yields one fundamental conclusion. The outcome of next year's federal election is in all, almost every respect uncertain. The only certainty is the considerable importance of polling data amidst the different phases of the electoral process. Just as the Christian Democrats and the Greens will settle on their own respective chancellor candidate that is the most popular among the wider public, weekly polls will provide information about the feas feasibility of various coalition models. The 2017 federal election illustrated just how quickly pu public moods can shift. Entering the year with promising polling numbers, thanks to a popular new leader and candidate for the chancellery, Martin Schulz, the SPD's campaign nonetheless imploded within a matter of weeks. More than any other political actor, the Christian Democrats should heed this warning and not be blinded by their current strength in the polls. As Merkel missed the right moment for an orderly transfer of power during her last term in office, it is her party that is now faced with the most challenging position. Whether this marks the beginning of the CDU's departure from power after 16 years is something we will find out next year. And now for my last chart, you can see um, which coalitions could gain a majority right now, or which coalition uh, could gain no majority. So you see, uh, together with the Greens, the CDU, CSU uh, has a majority, so they won't need the Free Democrats as a, uh, another coalition partner. And uh, the other options, the red-green red, coalition or the uh, red-green coalition together with the liberals, they are short of uh, majority right now. But this may change in the election year. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, well, thank you very much, Frank. That was extremely insightful. I have quite a few questions myself, but I would also like to encourage all of our participants to write their questions in the Q&A box at the bottom, and then I will read the questions um, uh, off. But uh, um, while people start to uh, formulate their questions, uh, maybe I will, will start it off. Um, of course, as many people know, uh, the uh, current government and the parties in the Bundestag have been contemplating changes to the electoral system for quite some time. Um, of course, it was just a couple of cycles ago that they started with the so-called Ausgleichmandate, which of course proliferated 
in 2017. So we have the largest Bundestag ever at what, 709 members, well above the 598 minimum. And uh, that's also costing a lot of money. Uh, and I know that that's one of the issues that is, that is um, uh, spurring some protest in Germany. The um, governing parties have talked about some changes. Uh, for instance, reducing the number of constituencies, finding a way to cap the number of Ausgleich Mandate or compensatory mandates. So I'm just wondering if you think that that will be in place for the 2021 election and um, how that might affect the strength of parties in the Bundestag. Yeah, I'm very thankful for that uh, question because uh, what the two parties in government uh, are doing now, uh, they actually are not willing uh, uh, to, to change many things. So we will keep um, a Bundestag in 2021, but also in, in the forthcoming uh, elections uh, that has uh, seven, 100 deputies or more. So they are not willing to reduce the number uh, of deputies because it's comfortable for them. Uh, if you lose votes, you still can keep the seats in, in the Bundestag. And uh, they won't agree on a, a reform. What they have promised, what they have uh, promised now is not a reform. It doesn't deserve it, the, the word reform. And uh, they will do so without the consent of the opposition parties. And this is something that you should not do in a democracy. Uh, electoral laws uh, should be altered in a consent of, of the, at least of the, of the major parties. And uh, um, uh, we have a discussion now um, about um, a commission uh, that uh, could make uh, uh, suggestions for, for changes in, in the electoral system. And uh, I think it's necessary to have such a, a commission um, with experts, but maybe also with uh, ordinary citizens. Uh, the, the Canadian example is cited sometimes. I think it was in British Columbia uh, where such a, a commission made suggestions uh, for a change in the electoral system. Because the parties, they are, because of their own interests, for example, to keep mandates, they are not able to do this in a reasonable uh, uh, manner. And it's a completely failure. Uh, of the government uh, parties. So it's uh, something we have to talk about in, in, the, uh, in, in the next uh, uh, period. Uh, but uh, we will have a Bundestag in 2021 with still more than 700 uh, deputies. So there will be no reduction. All right, well, the, what is it? The um, Taxpayer Association will not be happy for that. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, we have a lot of excellent questions here. So I'm gonna um, get right into them and I, I might take them out of order. Uh, here's an excellent question from Shwetank um, in India. Why is the left-wing populism represented by Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn in other countries not, not getting any traction in Germany? Well, we have a left party, but uh, I wouldn't call it a populist party anymore. Because there was a time when the party was founded, like I mentioned, the former leader of the Social Democrats, uh, he was the first chairman of the nationwide left party. Because this party was a merger uh, of uh, the PDS and uh, a splinter party uh, uh, from the SPD because uh, uh, the uh, uh, labor market uh, uh, reforms uh, of uh, because of the labor market uh, reforms of uh, the red green government under uh, Gerhard Schröder and uh, with uh, 
Oscar Lafontaine, uh, this party really was a left-wing populist party, but now its, its style has, uh, has changed, so I would call it, it's, it's, a, it's a socialist party, not a social democratic party. Uh, it even has a, a, a communist wing. It's a very small wing, uh, but, it, but it isn't a, a populist party anymore. All right, um, here's a question from Stephen Brockman. Do you think there is a scenario in which the AFD would be able to join the next government? No, not at all, not at all. Because the AFD, like I said, is not only a, a right-wing populist parties, and uh, uh, we have a, a party family uh, in, in Europe, and I would uh, the uh, Trump, he's a, a right-wing populist as well, and maybe the whole Republican Party has become a kind of uh, populist party. And, uh, but uh, the AFD is also an extremist party, because like I said, almost half of the, the officials, the, the delegates, uh, at the party conventions, uh, they belong to the extremist uh, camp. And uh, it's not conceivable uh, for any political actor, including the conservative parties, the CDU, CSU, to have any cooperation with an extremist party in, uh, uh, in, in, in Germany. So there won't be any coalitions uh, at the federal level, also at the state level, but things are a little different uh, in, in, in the cities, uh, in, at the local level, especially uh, in uh, East Germany. And uh, in East Germany, the AFD gains more than 20% of the vote. In, in, in some regions, it gains almost 30% of the vote like Saxony and is um, the leading political force. And it's very difficult to ignore a party that is th that strong. So there are co cooperations with other parties, especially the conservatives, the CDU uh, at the local level, but there won't be any coalition, any cooperation at the state or federal level. Um, maybe to piggyback on that for a second, there's also a question here from Tom Lancaster. Um, he's referencing um, Antonis Elnis's book, Organizing Against Democracy, where he makes that distinction between um, extreme right parties versus far right parties. Um, um, uh, and also goes on to say that extreme right parties are motivated as much by social action as by electoral gains, which of course is what far right parties emphasize. So you said just now that you think that the AFD has both of these attributes, both an extreme right and a far right party, but I mean, how do you think that's gonna play out? Well, um, it's uh, a, a problem for right wing. I would call it not a, far, it's a far right party, but this is neutral. The notion is uh, neutral. It's on the far right uh, fringe of, of the uh, party system. I would call it, I, I would prefer uh, the notion a right-wing populist party. And it's always a problem for right-wing populists that see themselves as moderate forces if they are captured by extremists. And that is the case uh, in the AFD. So you really have a power struggle now between the more moderate camp. Uh, Jörg Meuthen is the co-chairman of the party. He's the leader of the moderate wing of the AFD and the extremist uh, camp, uh, which is led by uh, Björn Höcke, the party leader in Thuringia. And uh, so it's uh, quite possible uh, that there will be a split, a real uh, split uh, of, of the party, which of course would weaken uh, both right-wing populism and the extremist uh, forces. And this is a que question to be answered. It's, it's not impossible uh, that uh, right-wing populism might 
weaken or even disappear uh, in Germany once again. Well, I mean, that brings us back to the CDU. And here's a question from Fritz Heinzen. Um, and uh, would you please provide a quick assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of the leading CDU candidates um, for chancellor? And then um, also, what about the Söder uh, question, whether the minister president of Bavaria might um, uh, be the chancellor candidate? Well, there are three candidates. I, I didn't uh, uh, mention their uh, names in, in my talk. The, the first is uh, uh, Armin Laschet. He's the state premier of uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, uh, the state where I live. And um, he hits um, um, the single um, coalition of Christian Democrats uh, with the Free Democrats uh, in the German uh, states. Uh, he uh, belongs to the liberal uh, wing uh, in the uh, CDU. Uh, for example, he uh, supported uh, Chancellor Merkel's um, refugee uh, policies, uh, but uh, he is not uh, considered um, as a strong leader. Uh, by the wider public. And uh, this was uh, confirmed by his uh, policies during the corona uh, crisis, where he didn't favor very strict measures, um, opposite to, to uh, Markus Söder, uh, the chairman uh, of the CSU, the Bavarian uh, sister parties. Uh, the second candidate is uh, Friedrich Merz. Uh, he was already a candidate uh, two years ago, uh, and he was uh, defeated only by a very uh, narrow margin by um, um, Annegret kamp karrenbauer who, who has resigned uh, from, from, uh, uh, from the office. And uh, well, Friedrich Merz, that is very interesting because he really is a man of the past. He was uh, the, the chairman uh, of uh, the party group uh, in the Bundestag uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, Angela Merkel uh, forced him uh, uh, to, to resign uh, because she, uh, she wanted to become uh, the leader herself. And um, uh, Mac, uh, uh, he, ha he hasn't had any uh, political office ever since. And uh, Merz, he, is, uh, he belongs to the more conservative wing uh, of uh, the party. He is much in favor of uh, market liberalism on the one side and uh, uh, concerning social issues, uh, issues he holds more a conservative uh, uh, position. And uh, he is supported. Uh, it's, it's quite possible that he may win uh, because he is supported uh, by uh, the southern states, Baden-Württemberg, uh, for example, and also uh, by the east uh, German uh, states of, uh, in, uh, in the CDU. And uh, the third uh, candidate is Norbert Röttgen. Uh, he was uh, the former environmental uh, uh, minister uh, and uh, he is now uh, the chairman of the foreign policy committee in, in the Bundestag. Um, but he, uh, his ch chances are not, very, uh, are not very good. So it, it is very interesting because uh, normally the leader of the CDU should also be the next chancellor candidate of uh, the party. But as uh, all three candidates uh, are not supported by the wider public in that respect, uh, now uh, Markus Söder, the uh, leader of the Bavarian sister party, uh, he may become uh, a chancellor a candidate, or there may be a, a, a separation or a, a division of, 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 of power. For example, 
uh, Norbert Röttgen, he may become uh, the party uh, leader, but he says, uh, I, will because my, uh, I will not become the chancellor candidate. I leave it uh, to Markus Söder, uh, for example. And uh, we don't know. So ev everything is, is, is possible. So on the, and that's interesting. The only thing that's sure is it will be not a woman. And uh, every candidate, that's also interesting. The three candidates, they all come from the old federal republic and they come from North Rhine, uh, Westphalia, the same uh, state. So the next chancellor may come from North Rhine, Westphalia uh, or from uh, Bavaria. And it would be the first time uh, that uh, uh, the sister party, the smaller sister party uh, of uh, Bavaria, uh, that they would appoint uh, the chancellor. It's not impossible. Well, that hasn't worked out very well for the union parties the other two times. So uh, we shall see what happens with that. Um, um, here's a yeah. question about the role of religion in the 2021 election. Uh, do you think that it, religion will be um, an important kind of factor, um, for example, in attracting Christian environmentalists to the Greens? Uh, no. Um, uh, for example, in, in the US, you have uh, discussions about social issues uh, like abortion. And this is not uh, the case in Germany because Germany is a very uh, secularized uh, country, it has become. And even more uh, after uh, the reu after reun reunification, because uh, in East Germany, less than one third of uh, the population uh, belong to the church. So religion is it's not a factor. Culture is a factor. Identity politics is a factor, because the migration issue, of course, is associated with the so-called Christian uh, identity of uh, European countries, not just Germany, of European countries. So religion is an underlying factor, but it's not a central factor in itself. While we're on issues, uh, do you think that Nord Stream 2 is going to play a significant role in the elections? Well, in the US, there is a saying, uh, if I remember it rightly, foreign uh, policy has no constituency. So normally uh, elections are not dominated by uh, issues uh, of uh, foreign policy. It may play a role probably because we had now the, the um, uh, Navalny case, the, uh, as, uh, the assassination attempt, uh, and uh, there was a, a discussion of course about that, but uh, the agenda next year will be dominated by bread and butter issues, and it will be dominated for the first time uh, by the climate change issue. And uh, so foreign policy is not so important. But then may, of course, Nord Stream, it, it's, the issue is connected with environmental, uh, environmental questions also because it's a question if we, if we need that gas uh, of, or if we should change our, our policies because the Greens say we don't need that gas. So it's connected with environmental policies, but as a uh, foreign policy issue, I don't think that it will play a key role. All right, um, I'm gonna um, skip down to another policy question uh, from Karen Johnston, uh, which has to do with German views on the European Union's recent announcement of uh, migration policy reform. And um, especially if in 2021, we have a Jamaica coalition, how will the political dynamics around the Greens position on migration reform um, uh, interact with concerns to mitigate or contain um, anti-immigration sentiment? I think there is a consent uh, between uh, all the major parties uh, that, uh, we need a, a European uh, solution for that problem, the problem of asylum seekers and, and um, refugees. But of course, uh, there are differences uh, between uh, the union parties on the one side, and also the, the Free Democrats, 
and the Greens um, uh, on the other side. And, and uh, there may be conflicts in a, in a uh, prospective uh, government because the Greens, they prefer more liberal uh, policies uh, and uh, the, of course, the Christian Democrats, they prefer more restrictive uh, uh, measures, but both of them agree that this cannot be solved by any single country uh, in Europe, that we need European solutions. And both of the parties, uh, the Greens and uh, the uh, union parties are pro-European and uh, there has been a, a very interesting change in uh, policies towards uh, European policies uh, by uh, Angela Merkel uh, because she has now agreed uh, on um, well on common uh, European uh, bonds uh, or debts and uh, this is a significant uh, change in Christian democratic uh, policies and so it may be uh, so that maybe uh, is uh, uh, make it, it could make it easier uh, for the uh, for the Green Party to join a government led by a Christian democratic chancellor. All right so moving to the left party for a second. Here's a question from Nico Switek. Um, there's going to be an upcoming leadership change in the left party. Uh, do you think that this is going to change the profile of the party, uh, perhaps in a more pragmatic direction, and make a red, red, green government uh, more likely at the federal level? Well, hopefully. <laughs> I, I do not say this uh, because uh, I, I, I like uh, the, the, uh, the left uh, party, uh, but because it's good for democracy uh, to have, uh, um, um, to maybe have a government that is not uh, led uh, by uh, the union parties. So uh, um, democracies depend uh, on the possibility of a change uh, uh, in government. And uh, now this is a discussion uh, in, in the left party. There is a more um, radical wing with fundamental uh, positions. Uh, and there is a more pragmatic uh, wing. Uh, and. Uh, they are willing uh, to join coalitions with the SPD and, uh, and the Greens. And foreign policy is a very important issue there. Because, uh, for example, the uh, left party refuses any support for military interventions. Uh, but you may have, there may be a need for uh, military uh, uh, interventions or the membership uh, in in the in the uh, um, in the alliance, so that might be a problem. And we had a discussion right now uh, about uh, the Navalny uh, case, where the where uh, politicians uh, of the left uh, wouldn't agree that Russia, uh, that Putin. Uh, was uh, responsible for that uh, assassination uh, attempt. Um, now that's uh, that's the case. Uh, I think that, uh, so, and uh, of course we have a, a double leadership in, in the party, and uh, it's a proportional leadership. So one of them will belong more to the pragmatic uh, camp. That might be, uh, I don't remember her name, Susanne Welso. Uh, she, uh, she's a, a party leader in Thuringer. And uh, the other is Jan Janine uh, Whistler. Uh, and she belongs to the, to, to the more radical uh, camp. And uh, so that's very difficult. Uh, but things have changed a little because the, the SPD and also the Greens uh, they ruled out uh, coalitions with uh, the, the left-wing party um, uh, four years ago or eight years ago uh, before the federal elections, I, and they won't do that now. So there might be a chance, but uh, 
uh, as this constellation is short of a majority, uh, I do not see that we will have a, a leftist uh, coalition uh, in Germany. Are we running out of time? Um, so I think we have time maybe for two more questions. Uh, here's one from George Bulow, um, talking about the irony of the appeal for the far right to Easterners, who of course grew up under the Gestapo and then the Stasi. Um, what do you think will have to take place in unified Germany for such distinctive voting patterns to change in a manner more akin to the West? Ooh, so we need another <laughs> webinar. Uh, uh, to answer uh, that uh, question, uh, we have to remember, and I, I mentioned it at the beginning of my talk, that East Germany is a post-communist society. And communism in East Germany lasted for 40 years. And to overcome such uh, political system may last 40 years as well, or more than 40 years. And I think that's something we have uh, underestimated uh, in, the, in the 1990s. Of course, we have also economic problems. There still is a gap uh, between uh, the West and the Eastern part uh, of the country, but it's more the question uh, of uh, identity. So I think you mentioned that uh, um, I deal with comparative uh, politics. Uh, I think uh, sometimes, or it's, it should be uh, more useful uh, to compare East Germany with other countries in uh, Middle and Western and, uh, and Eastern Europe, because they are all uh, post communist uh, uh, societies. And this will take uh, uh, quite a while. So we have, because you, you asked, what can we do? Of course, we have to address the question of identity politics. We have to address the migration uh, issue uh, in, in policies. And like I mentioned, this is something that we hadn't done um, in the 1990s uh, and, uh, and before. Uh, the conservative parties, the CDU, CSU, even stated that uh, Germany wasn't an immigration country, which, which is absurd because we are, and we have to deal with it, and we have to address all these uh, questions. All right, well, um, I think we have time for one more question, and um, I'm gonna um, uh, pop in here myself. And um, so you mentioned on actually two different occasions that the performance of the Grant Coalition before the coronavirus, of course, was, quote, miserable. And um, I, I'd like you to perhaps share a few more thoughts on um, why you would um, consider the performance of the government to be uh, that poor, especially you know, from my perspective here in Washington, DC, when I look at the sheer legislative output of what the you know, miserable grand coalition is doing, pension reform, for instance, debt relief for cities. I mean, it seems pretty substantial given um, the complete lack of anything really happening uh, um, in Washington, D.C. So um, why do you think the performance has been so poor? Well, what does performance mean? You're absolutely right. Um, if you look at the, the policies and if you compare it uh, with other countries, uh, it wasn't uh, that uh, miserable. Uh, but uh, you have uh, to remember how, how that coalition came about in 2017. Um, at, the evening, uh, at the evening of uh, the election, uh, the SPD declared that, it, uh, that the party was happy to leave the grand coalition and uh, to go and to be an, an, an opposition party. And that would not happen. Uh, because um, the Free Democrats got uh, cold feet. They hadn't the courage uh, to join a, a coalition with uh, the union parties and, uh, and the Greens, though the SPD had uh, to step in. And uh, then you have to remember, it was only a, a few weeks 
uh, after the coalition came in office, that there was a severe crisis provoked by Interior Minister uh, Horst Seehofer. Uh, and uh, so uh, this coalition didn't work from the very beginning. So, uh, and, that, and that was a problem. And uh, well, that's the irony. Uh, the pandemic uh, has changed that, but uh, only to the advantage to the union party, to the union parties. The, the SPD, even though it holds the ministries that are very important in that crisis, for example, the social uh, ministry, they still have about 16 or 17 percent um, uh, in, in the posts. But at least they have regained a majority now. And uh, if you had said that uh, there, was a, there would be a time in Germany that the grand coalition would not be able uh, to gain a majority in, in, in uh, the electorate, that would, you would have been declared uh, crazy. Uh, and uh, if you had said uh, two or three years ago that maybe Markus Söder uh, would become the next chancellor, you would have been declared uh, crazy. So uh, many things uh, have changed and the whole system and the electorate is very volatile. So, and uh, therefore, I, that's what I said. The only certainty is that the polls are very uh, important and the, the politicians, they, they always say, we don't look at the polls, but sure, surely they do. And uh, the voters will- Well, I think well. that's a- a very fitting final thought for this uh, overview of the last 30 years of de development in the German party system. Two years is obviously a long time in politics and 30 years is uh, even longer. So thank you very much, Dr. Decker, for taking the time um, to speak with us today. I you. also want to thank the um, Embassy of Germany in the United States for their generous support of this uh, series. Um, and um, I hope that everybody else will um, come back for some of our other events including our upcoming uh, webinar on October 13th on climate policy. So we will um, send out details about that soon. And for those of you who don't know me, I forgot to introduce myself at first. I am Eric Langenbacher, the uh, director of the Society, Culture, and Politics program here at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. So, so thank you all for attending, and hopefully we will see you soon.